Yeah, thank you, mate. Really, really good. Uh, so, yeah, is there any questions in the room? Does anyone have anything they would like to uh, sort of ask Patrick about kind of their setup at Board Intelligent, as they face anything like that? I've got some. Uh, just ask one more thing. So, you skipped over a bit there. Um, one of the issues you skipped over was a really challenging question about how you use the fire, how, how you give people VPN access, and that VPN access still be kind of yeah. they can't get everything. Yes. So on the VPN and firewall side, we have adopted um, uh, WireGuard, which is, which is a VPN which is built on, well, I guess a lot of VPN technology is built on public-private key encryption. But an interesting thing with, with WireGuard is that it makes it very easy to cryptographically ensure that the VPN client address of X is always Johnny. The, 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 there can never be a case where Johnny gets any other IP address than X. So based on that, then we can very easily say that, well, Johnny should only ever be able firewall uh, at, at a firewall level to connect to anything but the permafrost API. While someone like myself might have different uh, firewall rules, which says that you can access well, anything basically. The, 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 it, it's an open one. And then you can have everything in between where you might be able to access permafrost and Kubernetes, but you can't, uh, uh, you can't connect to SSH. So, so you, again, you can, you can use that and, and you start off with kind of a crypto, cryptographically secure way of identifying who is who. Any questions? Yes. Um, you said it would be really nice to have. Um, client side encryption. Is that because some clients, even with the level of security that you have right now, are still not happy with the level of security? Or why, why is that? A, you um, excited about that? Well, it's one of these things where require ones interested in, it's always hard to know before, you know, deep diving into it. We, we can all have our own private opinions about that, but but it's certainly something that people are excited about, and uh, it's it's uh, yeah. So um, we've actually we actually lost one big client pitch quite recently, um, and this is just one example, but it but it does happen where we were the best provider for the business solution they wanted, but um, in the end they had to go with a provider who could provide an on-premise solution, of which there are not very many, and they took a big hit in functionality to do that. Um, they were in a regulated industry. And they said, basically, we were looking for a, a provider who could give a bring your own key, key solution because only through bring your own key can we be sure that nobody else is looking at this data. So obviously, we've got all this great security, but at the end of the day, someone on board intelligence still has control over those keys. We have now, and we have great internal controls over that, so I'm not worried about it, but how can they be sure? So, uh, so they took a big hit in functionality in order to, to take an on-premise solution. They basically went, if, you've got, if you had your bring your own key solution, we could have used you. And so it's things like that. So that's just one example, but th there was, there's, there's enough interest out there. I think the first providers, provider providers who have a solution like this is going to be a competitive advantage because people will be able to, to get, get access to a much wider range of functionality. You won't need on-premise anymore. You can use this instead. Any more questions? Don't be shy. I've got one. Um, do you think, is there anything that you uh, kind of have identified that you're going to need to significantly change when you get to that kind of next level of scale where you're saying about... Um, we're happy with where we're at at the moment. And then if we scale significantly, it becomes a good problem. Is there anything that you kind of know now that you're going to have to change kind of ahead of time, but even though you're happy with how it is at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's it's primarily on the state side of things. So I think the our, our sort of Kubernetes cluster and the automatic failovers per client deployments, all that kind of stuff on the stateless part is, I think is, I don't foresee needing much uh, re-architecting or a lot of work, so to speak. But for example, at some point, it's not good enough to just try to use a bigger Postgres server. Uh, you know, in terms of the number of network connections, even if you use connection pools and so forth, at some point, we're going to need multiple Postgres clusters. So now we have additional complexity in terms of like which client is associated with which, which Postgres cluster and how do we keep these Postgres clusters somewhat balanced in terms of load and because it's not just about 
the number of clients is about which type of client is it because we have some clients who are this big and some clients who are that big so so to, so to get that right is obviously not uh, it's not something we've solved uh, and it's not something we need to solve at the moment because we're fine with just kind of having slightly bigger service but over time that is going to become something uh, that's, that 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 happens uh, on the Object Store, the OpenStack Swift side, we're probably okay. So far, it seems like that scales in, in, a, in a very horizontal way. Just, just add a few more machines. Uh, Kafka should be similar. So uh, probably Kafka and OpenStack, we won't really need much one. OpenStack, uh, sorry, Postgres, I think we will need some re-architecting on. But then also, there's also the operational people question at some point. If we have 10,000 clients and we have, you know, 50 service per data center, we then also know that we're going to have X power failures per quarter or whatever. And there's going to be an extra level of uh, kind of just maintenance and stuff on that side, which we don't have today. Today, we're okay. If something breaks, it, it doesn't affect things unless it's like the Postgres master or something like most things can break. And if we get to it in a week or two weeks time, it's fine. We, we have more capacity than we need, and we can fix things when, when, when we need to. But at some point, those sorts of things also start to become a, a, a much bigger part of it. Would you ever deploy to public cloud as a sort of wrapping up, wrap it up rate solution for clients that didn't care about? So today, we don't. Uh, and, you know, you know we're, we're, we're only a handful of people maintaining all of this. So, uh, and, and, and that's being generous. <laughs> so, in, so in terms of maintaining both, say, an AWS setup and our own data centers and mixing and matching and, you know, doing releases and all that, it, it just adds a lot of complexity. Obviously, if I look at the way we've chosen the components going into our infrastructure. Do I think it would take a lot of time to move what we have onto, say, Google Kubernetes engine? I don't think it would. I think it would be a pretty s slim, uh, you know, it'd take us a month or two to kind of finesse everything. But, you know, that, that's part of kind of future proofing this. I mean, the iterations of this system started before Docker. There was LXE containers before Docker. Then Docker came and my scripts and LXE became Docker. Then there was kind of a hacky, shitty version of Docker Composer Kubernetes, which was on top of Docker. And then Kubernetes shows up and we scrapped that and move to Kubernetes. So we're kind of trying to move with, as the tools get better, we're trying to adopt more and more of them, trying to use other people's code instead of our own. And in an ideal world, you know, we, we do think that within probably the next five years, a lot of these industry regs and so forth will change and we will probably be able to navigate into more of a public cloud kind of a flexi flexible deployment uh, solution. Uh, but in terms of the rapid upgrade thing, that's, uh, that's actually interesting, not one of the things we ever need to do because the way, so our software is not actually resource intensive, there's, there's nothing in there where you suddenly need to spike up to a huge, huge extra processing power or extra storage space extra RAM. So within our infrastructure, we've got way more capacity than we'll ever need for any clients. What if you started doing analytics or something like that? If we started doing analytics, things would change, but at the moment we're not, we're not doing anything that heavy. So. There's, there's, there's no conceivable stuff. Yeah, we, we, we need more the operational fluidity of managing hundreds of clients and deployments rather than the bursty, you know, today I need 20 servers and tomorrow I need 250. We don't have that problem. We have more the how do we manage all this stuff and keep it, you know, in terms of backups and all, all the kind of stuff when you when you have all these uh, parallel deployments. That That's our big thing. So I guess we're... We're doing a cloud-like thing only in one dimension, not in the kind of <laughs> burstability space, more in the operational maintenance piece. Yes? So obviously using containers helps a lot uh, in terms of uh, adding things to the stack. So my question is more around the extra stuff that you're running, for example, the permafrost and so on. Mm -hmm. so you wanted to deliver like a new product feature that required like, a particular change to the infrastructure. Or addition to the service to the stock, say, elastic mm -hmm. How How easy is it with the current stack? So, it depends on if it's a stateful or a stateless thing. So, Permafrost itself runs inside of Kubernetes. It's, it lives in the same monorepo as all of our other services. And the only difference is it's kind of the chicken and egg uh, question. It's the, you know, whatever you think it comes first, it's the chicken or the egg. Uh, and so hence that part is deployed 
through Ansible, and and it, you know it's packaged as a Docker container and so forth, just like everything else. Uh, it's just that the deployment step and the CI/CD pipeline for the permafrost API is slightly different from the other services because the other services rely on permafrost. So 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 anything stateless um, is 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 very you know you just stick stuff in the mono repo and deploy it and, and Bob's your uncle. Anything stateful like Elasticsearch or something that as I said, that doesn't belong inside of our Kubernetes cluster, so that then becomes Ansible stuff. Uh, we dockerize it and whatnot, but uh, we, we also try very hard to limit our stateful pieces. We used to have more stateful pieces than we have today, and we've tried to put more and more things into Postgres and more and more things into Kafka, basically. Try, try to reduce that complexity if we can. If you had the client-side encryption, any of your customers would be willing to use the public cloud? Or, yeah. Yeah. Now, the problem we have at the moment is not that none of our clients would allow us to use public cloud, so a significant portion of them would make the procurement process so long that by the time we finally jump through the hoops, they kind of, we've all given up on that. Um, so that's why we do this. But certainly the portion, the portion of those that would allow us to use public cloud would definitely go off if we had the your key. So sometimes it, is, it even has with like you know American companies and you know where the data resides and even if it's encrypted, they might still think that it's still physically located somewhere with, with or owned uh, in a legal sense by someone that they can't contract with. So there's still problems. Yeah. How do you ensure? It's an external login service. How do you ensure that nothing in the logs includes this information? Well, that is always a, a problem, right? But th this this is why we have a, a completely separate lab environment with separate external accounts to all of our services. So you know, we we don't have say our staging or our lab environment in the same accounts as our production stuff. So we run stuff in our staging stuff first, and obviously. Try you know as part of our kind of QA stuff is to go go through the logs and see that it, it, it nothing nothing bad is there. Depending on which framework you use, which services you use, sometimes you kind of have automatic sort of inbuilt way of filtering out stuff that looks sensitive. Uh, it's it's not something that has like one answer. It's Try to use the tools within the software space that we have, then use the lab and the segregation of being able to do everything in a in, in a play environment first, uh, be part of your QA process, and then by the time you've done all of that, uh, you 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 know we, we we've done what we can in terms of uh, uh, and also educating developers, right? You know, don't don't just throw out whatever in, in, in exception messages or, uh, or, or log messages. Yeah. You rely a lot on, on BGP. Yep. And as you said, it's 24, 25 years old, so it's mature. However, in the past three years, there's been a lot of traffic shaping and BGP hijacking. And it's considered for some info security as the weakest thing in the internet right now. How do you secure the BGP? It's, it, it's all it's all internal, right? We we have no part of our BG, our BGP uses uh, you know private ASN numbers. It doesn't it doesn't connect to the internet at all. It's just internal. So yeah, the the basically for to someone to inject something into BGP, they first have to hack another like five levels of our stack. <laughs> so. Yes, I, I agree. As a, as as a protocol, it's by no means the the most secure. The, the you know it was built in a time that weren't uh, having the same problems we have today, right? But but the way we deploy it, it it, it just runs on internal uh, internal private links. It never touches any external data, so it, it's pretty you know it's pretty safe. Cool. I think we've only got time for one more. If there is one in the room, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I'm just thinking. Um trying to um, assess, in, in a way, the, the challenges and surely you must be facing with your bare metal infrastructure. Because obviously, um, one of the benefits of going into the cloud is you know, the provision of everything is a few clicks away. But um, working with bare metal components, I'm, I'm in several different locations, in several different data centers, several different kind of hardware providers, and so on. I guess it must be a challenge, right? To do, 
do a scale out your equipment and kind of be ready to snap it. If we were in a either very resource intensive service space or a very bursty kind of landscape, then we would have more problems. The way it is today, as I said, we you know we have in the order of I think 15, 20 servers per data center. That gives us probably two to three times the amount of resources that we need for today uh, for still a very, very low cost. So in terms of the cost of over provisioning by a factor of two or three, uh, is not particularly high. So we, we, we never end up in a scramble saying that, oh my God, we need, you know, X new service tomorrow. That, that, that's not a problem that we have. We, you know, we see that coming long, long way before it ever happens. So we don't have that bare metal problem. Uh, previously, before we kind of have had gotten to the state we are today, then you know, then you, then you have the normal things where if something breaks and you don't have enough redundancy and you need to get to Edinburgh tomorrow or or in two hours to fix something because a, a disk broke, then then that would be a problem, right? But we're trying to build around that, but basically saying, you know, if something is broken, it's broken, and it just goes out of the deployment. You know, it, it's K Kubernetes, for example, will just know that the node is down and all the work will migrate elsewhere and we basically don't do anything other than schedule a visit to fix it the next time it makes sense to go there. If it's just a single disk and a single server, we, we might just wait for like a month or two months but, but, and, and have a batch of stuff to go and, and do at the same time. So yeah, so basically over provisioning and not being at a number of servers where, we, where something breaks every day <laughs> is, is good enough for now. But obviously, if that 1520 becomes 100 or 200, then we're going to have a lot more of those things. And then it's going to be, as I said b before, then it's going to require sort of more, more separate management. One thing to help everyone understand that here is that the value of our product is much more in the user interface and the workflow it enables for the people. It's not in the, um, the processor power of the computer. So it's not a low margin. Uh, get the most efficient use out of the out of the the uh, service you've got kind of scenario. So that's why we can afford to over provision by so much so that we don't have those kind of problems you've described. But if, if that wasn't true, then we absolutely wouldn't be able to do this. So backend is more like storage. It's, 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 uh, it's less processing, it's more like storage. But there's, there's definitely processing, it's just yeah. not intensive processing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's also sort of predictive in a, in a pattern, right? It, it, at month end, quarter end, people have board meetings. We know there's going to be a lot of packs produced in the middle, you know, the, the third Tuesday of a random month, there's unlikely to be a lot of board meetings had. So, so there, there's predictability and we kind of know how it works and we, we, we can have, we can, yeah, we know the shape of it pretty well. Cool. Cool. Good stuff. Thanks very much, Patrick.